Hello everyone. In this lecture and in the next couple of series of lectures, we'll talk about carbon dioxide. So let's get started. CO2 is produced by aerobic metabolism and the only thing you have to remember in this case is something we call respiratory quotient, which is the ratio of carbon dioxide produced divided by how much oxygen was used. So for example, the respiratory quotient of carbohydrate is 1 because it uses 6 of oxygen and makes 6 of carbon dioxide. Similarly, the respiratory quotient of fat, you need around 59 molecules of oxygen, which will produce 40 molecules of carbon dioxide, and that will give you the respiratory quotient of 0.68. CO2 is sensed by both peripheral neurons and central neurons. In the peripheral neurons, they are present in the carotid body, and it senses both pH and carbon dioxide. The response is much more rapid because the carotid body is in a continuous contact with the bloodstream. The central neurons, on the other hand, uh, they are much more slowly to respond, but they contribute more to the minute ventilation. The central neurons are present in retro trapezoid nucleus in the brain stem, and the carbon dioxide has to cross through the blood brain barrier to reach the CSF, where it's converted into bicarb and hydrogen ions and this is sensed by the neurons. One of the things moving forward is you have to understand that only dissolved carbon dioxide is responsible for the partial pressures of the carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide is combined to other molecules, it does not contribute to the partial pressures. As the CO2 levels rise, the minute ventilation also increases. And this process is augmented by hypoxia, so for the same degree of pco2 your minute ventilation is higher if you are also hypoxic if you have got other forms of acidosis producing h plus ions it will be sensed as well and will cause even further rise in minute ventilation so the minute ventilation increases with metabolic acidosis hypoxia and hypercapnia let's talk about how carbon dioxide transported back from the cellular level to the lungs. The black dots represents carbon dioxide molecules. So some of the carbon dioxide is transported as in dissolved form. That gives rise to your partial pressures of carbon dioxide that you know about. Carbon dioxide also attaches to the hemoglobin molecule and aids in release of oxygen by Bohr's effect. So the carbon dioxide is transported as carbaminohemoglobin both alpha and beta chains of the hemoglobin can carry carbon dioxide. The majority of the carbon dioxide is transported in form of bicarb ions. Carbon dioxide is easily diffusible across the RBC cell membrane and red blood cells have a lot of carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase combines the water molecules and the carbon dioxide molecules into bicarb and hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions are buffered by the cellular proteins while the bicarb ions are exchanged with chloride ions using a transporter protein called band 3. So the carbon dioxide is transported in three forms, dissolved, protein bound and chemically modified as bicarb. Once in the pulmonary capillaries, opposite reactions happen. The dissolved carbon dioxide is easily diffusible across the alveolocapillary membrane. In the oxygen-rich area, the oxygen is combined with the hemoglobin molecule and subsequently the carbon dioxide is released, something we call Haldane's effect. Lastly, the bicarb is reconverted back to carbon dioxide and water using the carbonic anhydrase and the CO2 can diffuse across. Around more than half of the carbon dioxide is transported as a bicarb ion around one third as a carbamino and rest as dissolved carbon dioxide. Let's look at the carbon dioxide dissociation curve. Carbon dioxide dissociation curve tells you how much is the carbon dioxide content as your pso 2 changes. Part of the carbon dioxide is in the dissolved form and you know the solubility increases with increased partial pressures. Most of the carbon dioxide in the plasma is in the bicarbonate form, which acts as a buffer. Lastly, part of the carbon dioxide is also present as carbamino form, 
and because the carbamino amino has got different attachment property with hemoglobin of 100% versus 75%, you get two different lines. Looking at the total amount of CO2 content at the difference between the arterial and the venous level, you will be able to figure out how much of carbon dioxide is transported in which form. So we have a small amount of carbon dioxide which is transported as carbon dioxide dissolved in water. We have got CO2 that is carried by bicarbonate and we have got CO2 that is carried by the carbamino hemoglobin. Let's look at this area a little closely. So if there was no Holden bohrs effect, the amount of carbon dioxide carried as carbamino hemoglobin will be same at both 40 and 46 millimeter of mercury. Because of the Holden bohrs effect, the carrying capacity of carbon dioxide by the hemoglobin molecule is higher at 75% as compared to 100%. So there's an extra CO2 that is removed by this effect. So why does carbon dioxide rise when you give somebody 100% oxygen? This is seen mostly in COPD patients who have tendency to retain CO2 and this happens because of Haldane's Bohr effect. Normally the venous sats are around 70%. If you give somebody 100% oxygen, their oxygen carrying capacity is slightly higher than usual. So their venous side, you can have higher oxygen saturations. And because of Holden effect, the carrying capacity of carbon dioxide at 75% is lower than at 70%, which is represented by the green line. So if you give them more oxygen, more of the carbon dioxide is transported as dissolved form. So your PaCO2 rises. The PaCO2 didn't rise because there was more CO2. It just got displaced from hemoglobin to dissolved form. This is only one of the three reasons why the CO2 rises. We'll talk about the other two. The most important reason is increased VQ mismatching. Let's see how it happens. Here we have got two alveoli. Both of them are normal and you are giving 20% oxygen to these patients. The black dots are carbon dioxide molecules. So most of the carbon dioxide molecules is able to be transferred to the alveoli without any problems. In areas with dysfunctional alveoli, your body will perform hypoxemic vasoconstriction so as to decrease the blood flow to these areas. Blood flow is now redirected towards normal alveoli where the CO2 can again diffuse out easily. This is a CT scan of a COPD patient and we have got areas of bad alveoli and your body has adequately performed hypoxemic vasoconstriction so that means there's not much blood flow to these bigger uglier alveoli and most of the blood flow goes to the normal alveoli if you give somebody 100 percent oxygen you will inhibit hypoxemic vasoconstriction and you will have blood flow to the non-functional alveolar regions but the co2 in that blood will be unable to diffuse out so you will have recirculation of carbon dioxide and thus elevating your CO2 levels. VQ mismatching accounts for 50 to 60% of rise in CO2 when you give somebody 100% oxygen, followed by Haldane effect, which contributes 30 to 40% of the increase. Lastly, removing hypoxemic drive in these patients can also increase in CO2, but the effect is much lower. The rise in the PaCO2 with oxygen can be of order of 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury, which can be clinically significant. One of the things to remember is treating hypoxia is more important. So if your patient needs oxygen because his SATs are low, do not hesitate to give him higher FiO2 because you're worried that CO2 will rise. The optimal answer in this situation is to target SATs of 90 to 94% with your FiO2. That will minimize the CO2 rise while giving adequate oxygen to the patient. We talked about that CO2 diffuses 20 times more rapidly than oxygen and this is because carbon dioxide is 20 times more soluble in water. Do you remember this diagram from hypoxia series? Oxygen takes around 0.05 seconds to cross the alveolocapillary membrane and enter the RBCs and it takes around 0.2 seconds for the oxygen to combine with hemoglobin molecule, giving you time around 0.25 seconds to complete the whole oxygenation of the hemoglobin molecule. 
the CO2 on the other hand is much faster. We already talked that CO2 is transported mostly by as bicarb and as Harlan effect. These reactions are pretty fast of the order of less than 0.1 second. Carbonic anhydrase as we talked about is one of the fastest enzymes in nature and CO2 diffuses around 20 times faster than oxygen. So CO2 goes from capillaries to the alveoli in matter of milliseconds. It is much much faster than oxygen and that's why reducing surface area or re reducing the quality of alveolar capillary membrane does not cause hypercapnia. Hypercapnia is almost always from lack of ventilation. That means inability to get out of the alveoli. A word about carbonic anhydrase. It can hydrate a million of carbon dioxide molecules in a second and thus it takes less than a tenth of a second for all carbon dioxide carried by hemoglobin and bicarb to get converted into carbon dioxide and diffuse into alveoli. One other question I'll leave you to answer is do carbonic anhydrate inhibitors such as astazolamide cause hypercapnia? So in summary, CO2 is transported in three forms, bicarb, carbaminohemoglobin and dissolved forms. CO2 rises when given oxygen due to worsening VQ mismatch and bohr harlan effect and reduction in hypoxic drive. CO2 is transported from pulmonary capillaries to alveoli very rapidly. Thank you.